All right, welcome back to Solid State Physics in a nutshell. This is Eric Tober. So far, we've thought about elastic diffraction, and we've thought about lattice vibrations, where we've had normal modes, and we've populated these modes with phonons. Today, we're going to take a look at scattering from time-varying structures using a technique known as phonon spectroscopy. Okay, going back to when we thought about elastic scattering, we had some incident wave vector k that by the time it got to the sample, we approximated as a plane wave. And we found that constructive interference at the detector was going to occur when delta k equals g for a periodic sample. In this case, the amplitude of the detector was given by an integral across the sample volume that was illuminated, the scattering density n, and this i to the k dot r plus omega t term. So today we're going to consider moving atoms where the scattering density n now has a time dependence. So rather than developing a generalized approach for any n of r and any time variation, we're going to make a couple big approximations today. First, we're going to treat the atoms as point scattering sources with one atom at each lattice point. When we do this, we can say that our scattering density n is then simply the sum across a set of delta functions positioned at r minus some rt. And this second term here is going to be position of the atom that's based at the lattice point t, but that position of the atom is going to vary a bit as a function of time. Down here on the lower left, we can see that variation with time. Each atom is set at some uh, original point t, and as time moves on, the atom simply oscillates about t. Okay, so we have these two expressions then. We have this expression for the time dependence of the scattering density, and we also have this highly generalized description of the scattered amplitude at the detector. What we can do is we can insert the scattering density into this integral, and what's nice is that because we have delta functions in the integral, the integral is going to drop away, and we're going to be simply left with the summation here. The first trick we can play is to take this time-dependent r and separate it into the original lattice position, just simply r of t, and then a displacement off of that, u, which should sound pretty familiar from phonons. In that case, we can recast the scattering density in the following way, where we separate out this r sub t term and then the displacement off of r in this other exponential here. We can expand this u of t term for small displacements in the following way, where we take the exponential and expand it out in this 1 minus i delta k dot t term. In 3D, we're going to write our displacements u as a function of t as a single traveling wave like yay, where we've got the same q that we developed for phonons. And that q has an associated frequency shown here. So this is just a normal mode in the lattice, nothing more. Plugging all of this back in, we get this lovely expression here, which is composed of two parts. First, this summation here that should look pretty familiar. That's going to be the standard elastic scattering expression. And we have this nice second part here, which is the inelastic part. And that's really what we're focusing on today. We can obtain an expression for constructive interference by looking at the first exponential, where we see that delta k plus or minus q is going to be equal to g, which we can rewrite as delta k has to equal g, but now plus or minus q. And the frequency at the detector when we do this is going to be the original frequency plus or minus the frequency of the phonon associated with q. So with these two expressions for delta k and the final omega, let's take a look at the physical picture of what this really means. Say, for example, I've got a neutron incident on my sample, and then it's diffracted off at some angle constructively. In this inelastic case, the neutron potentially absorbs a phonon, gaining both the momentum and the energy of that phonon, or the neutron is going to create a phonon in the process, and it's going to lose both the momentum and the energy that was required to create the phonon. Vector-wise, this is going to be significantly more tricky than the elastic case. So if we absorb a phonon into the neutron, and the energy of the neutron rises, then the final wavelength is going to be shorter than the initial wavelength. If the final wavelength is shorter, that means that the magnitude of the final k vector, k prime, is going to be greater than the initial magnitude. So we can sketch that here on the right, where the magnitude of k is shorter than the magnitude of k prime. And we have delta k off slightly to this right angle here. On the other hand, the situation is reversed if the neutron that's instant on the sample creates a phonon donating some of its energy to the sample, the delta k is switched off to the other side. So if you had a given source and a detector position, like yay, you can see that depending on whether or not you're creating or absorbing phonons, you could potentially be sampling two different points in reciprocal space, and that's just for a single type of phonon being created or destroyed. 
So an elastic scattering is really pretty tricky. The magnitude of k is not going to equal the magnitude of k prime, although in some cases we approximate it as such. And generally we're going to have to think about satisfying this delta k equals g plus or minus q criteria. Finally, we have to make sure that the final frequency equals the initial frequency plus or minus the frequency of the phonon. If this wasn't such a neat technique that gave us so much information, I don't think we'd bother going through all of this. But from inelastic scattering, we can get so much information that it's really worth the struggle. So for the rest of this video, we're just going to consider the inelastic scattering of visible light, which is known as Raman spectroscopy. In this case, we're going to use a source like Ye, coming in along the proverbial x-axis and interacting with a sample. Then we're going to put a detector off at 90 degrees from that, and the detector is going to be a frequency-dependent detector, which is to say what I'm calling D actually has a splitter in it that separates out all the frequencies spatially. Right away when I say visible light, the first thing that should come into your head is, well, this is weird because I thought that elastic scattering and visible light were incompatible because delta K could never get out to a capital G vector. Let's start by considering the magnitude of K prime versus K for visible light. To answer that question, first of all, we need to remind ourselves how much change in energy is possible with either creating or absorbing a phonon with visible light. So a handy dandy rule to keep in mind is that the energy of light can be converted to wavelength with this formula here. And so we can see that if we have instant red light, say at 620 nanometers, we're going to be dealing with 2 eV light. If our original instant light has 2 eV, and then the highest energy phonons are about 0.05 eV, that means that E prime, which is to say the energy of the exit light that's been inelastically scattered, can vary from 1.95 up to 2.05 eV. And that's an upper bound because I'm invoking the highest energy phonon is either being created or absorbed. So let's split this then into two columns, either a phonon being absorbed by the instant red light, increasing the energy of the red light therefore, or the red light creates a phonon as it passes through the sample and lowers the energy of the light. We can take a look at the wavelength, so we see that the red light becomes orange, or a deep red, depending on whether or not you're creating or absorbing phonons. And really, the take-home message here is in this last line, where the change in the magnitude of k, from k prime to k, is an incredibly small number, particularly compared to the size of the reciprocal lattice. So this isn't always going to be the case, but for visible light, we're basically going to invoke that the magnitude of k prime is close enough to the magnitude of k that we're going to treat it as equal when we do our vector diagrams. Additionally, we see that the magnitude of k is really small. It's way smaller than the magnitude of g1. And so I've drawn that here in the lower left where I've got this little teeny tiny k vector in, and a little teeny tiny k vector out, and the delta k then is this wee little thing here. Remembering that for inelastic scattering, we need delta k to equal g plus or minus q for constructive interference. We have only a q max here from phonons of pi over a, and thus the only g that can satisfy delta k equals g plus or minus q is going to be at g equals zero, which is to say the origin. And so we end up simply with the expression delta k equals plus or minus q for constructive interference of the detector. As a reminder, for the elastic case where we had delta k equals g equals zero, that was simply transmission, where you had a k in and a k out, and the difference between those two was null. So with this condition that delta k equals plus or minus q for constructive interference, we then need to think about what the magnitude of delta k then is. Since the biggest delta k we can get is twice the original k naught magnitude, which is to say it's way smaller than g1. And if it's way, way smaller than g1, that means that only phonons that are extremely close to gamma are going to be involved in inelastic scattering of visible light, which is to say those phonons right up here. So let's zoom in then a little closer on this origin and take a look at k and k prime and the associated delta k. So now let's consider the case of a phonon being absorbed by that incident red light. When the phonon's absorbed by the light, the frequency of k prime is now going to be the original frequency, omega naught, plus the frequency of this particular q vector. So let's see how this translates to a real experiment. If I've got a three-dimensional solid that has three optical branches, one, two, and three, and I have a detector that can resolve different frequencies and their associated intensities, 
What I'm going to see is first a peak at the original frequency due to specularly scattered light. Then at slightly higher energies, I'm going to see three peaks associated with these three optical nodes due to phonons being absorbed by the light and gaining that energy. On the other side, I'm going to see those three peaks mirrored about frequency naught due to that light creating phonons. So in short, what we have here is a spectroscopic way to take a look at the phonon modes right at the gamma point. So to recap, we started by thinking about the scattering density, now not just as a function of position, but also as a function of time. And we were able to describe the time dependence as our U of t that we developed simply for phonons. When we brought that into our expression for an amplitude, we ended up developing criteria for constructive interference. Namely, that delta k needs to equal g plus or minus q, and that the final frequency better equal the original frequency plus or minus the frequency of the q vector. And to see how these expressions really play out in real inelastic scattering experiments, we took this and applied it to visible light scattering using a frequency resolved detector. And from that, we were able to see that we could actually identify specific phonon modes within the sample. Next time, we're going to look a little more closely at inelastic neutron scattering, since that's been the bread and butter of inelastic techniques for the last 50 years or so. All right, see you next time, folks.